Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello friends, welcome back to this follow-up session on uh, mental imagery and visual imagery. So in the last class, uh, what we saw was what are visual images and what is imagery and we looked at uh, what are the pitfalls of using imagery and why imagery studies uh, were uh, negated in the beginning of uh, psychology. So, uh, several reasons for example, imagery cannot be uh, verified, it is very personal, also imagery, uh, mental imagery is, equi is equivalent to a picture and so uh, that is one concern, uh, we cannot see imagery and we cannot actually verify people's imagery. Uh, also the idea that uh, there is something called visual imagery code into long term memory is also uh, not proven through experiments and so imagery studies were not taken seriously in the beginning of uh, psychology. But later on with a uh, um, classical book by Alan Pavio on mental uh, uh, representations and uh, using the dual uh, code processing model uh, talked a lot about what visual imagery and what other different uh, things that can be done with visual imagery. So, uh, one of the things that visual imagery does for us is it makes things easier for us, it makes retrieval of information easier for us. So, if information is stored in uh, the uh, long term memory as visual code or as visual images, it is much easier for us to retrieve it back. Uh, the reason being that visual images are more um, uh, informative and uh, are more easily accessible. And so, uh, we uh, in the last class also uh, uh, told you a lot about uh, different types of uh, visual imagery techniques which help you into remembering or retrieval of information. Now, some of these techniques were method of uh, loci and the peg word method and also the method of interacting images. Now, in each of these what we actually did was uh, in the method of loci, uh, we made a mental picture of a, a space, a physical space uh, that we are very familiar with and what we did was the uh, things that we need to learn was taken in and uh, then packed onto or tagged onto certain locations of this well known space. Now, in uh, this way when we remembered the space and certain locations in the space, those things that we wanted to retrieve came back to us. Now, in the uh, interacting images technique, what we did was we remembered two bits of information uh, as images and then we combined these two bits of information into an interactive image. For example, remembering a dog or a pipe. Uh, how do we remember that? So, imagine a dog, imagine a pipe and then go ahead and combine them together by imagining a dog smoking a pipe. Now, it is funny, it is novel and things which are novel are remembered uh, much better than things which are routine. That is uh, novelty is something which the brain treats as uh, interesting or uh, as more uh, uh, as, as uh, more retrievable. So, uh, novelty is the reason why it is retrievable. Now, in the third method, the pegword method, we specifically did not use imagery. What we did was we used a technique in which a uh, kind of uh, uh, routine uh, ordered list uh, which we uh, have wrote memorization of was used and things were then tagged onto this list. And so, basically uh, what we could do is uh, how these lists, lists are, this wrote uh, memorized list, uh, it could be lists that we uh, learned in nursery as nursery rhymes for example, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 or A, B, C, D kind of a thing and then we tag on these uh, wrote uh, memorized list onto certain uh, information that we want to stick into it and so that is what 
uh, we did. So, 1, 2, buckle my shoe, 3, 4, shut the door, 5, 6, pick up the sticks, 7, 8, lay them straight, 9, 10, a big fat hen kind of a thing. And so, uh, there is a target and there is a queue and the queue is 1, 2, 3, 4, that is the memorized list and the target is the uh, words that you have to remember. Now, beside that, we also saw um, uh, several conceptualizations or several uh, reasons which were given of how these mnemonic techniques. So, basically the techniques that I just described are called mnemonic techniques, how do they work. And so, one of the explanation which was given was uh, uh, that in terms of the fact that LTM has dual code, a verbal code and a visual code and so these two codes actually lead to more number of retrieval cues and so they are better remembered and that is uh, the dual coding hypothesis proposed by Alan Pavio. We also looked at something called relational organizational uh, 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 hypothesis which was pre presented by Bauer, where he talks about the fact that uh, if two images are if uh, words that have to be learned are created as image and created as uh, combined images, then they have better remembering because we try to create a relation between these two images and have an organizational scheme for it. And so, that is the reason why uh, we have better recall. Uh, the last thing that we uh, did in the last uh, section or the last session was uh, looking at the evidences of visual imagery and we saw two tasks a visual task and a verbal task and we saw that uh, preferences in terms of method of retrieval was uh, for visual it was visual was better whereas for verbal the method of retrieval a verbal was better. Now, in today's uh, uh, lecture what we do is we will continue from what we learned in the last lecture and then look at some more evidence for the existence of visual imagery. So, one existence is that uh, the well evidence uh, for the existence of visual imagery is the fact that uh, a certain kind of visual image uh, when it is encoded the method of retrieval preferred for it is also visual. The second evidence is mental rotation. So, what is mental rotation? Basically, what people do is when they are given some mental images, when they are given some kind of a picture, they are able to mentally rotate. So, one important finding for imagery is that people can do sim uh, uh, simple rotations of images. Uh, for example, and they can mentally transform them. For example, look at this. Now, this kind of rotation that you are seeing of a uh, uh, basic curve of a, uh, a circle can be done mentally and so this people take in images and they can mentally rotate them. And so, if uh, we can test the idea or if we can provide evidence for the idea that people go ahead and transform these images or if we uh, can come up with solutions uh, in terms of the fact that uh, give them give people certain uh, certain uh, instances in which ask them to rotate a mental image and give them certain instances to verify whether uh, these images will fit into the model of their transformation or whether the sequence uh, give them a sequence uh, uh, out of their rotation and if they match then we can say that people form mental images and they also rotate them. Now, what I mean by that is give people uh, a certain mental image to think about and ask them to rotate into certain sequence for example, either anti clockwise or clockwise. Now, once they are doing that uh, give them a certain sequence uh, of rotation a certain uh, sequence of rotation from the uh, original angle of uh, rotation and ask them to verify whether this uh, is a part of uh, their mental rotation. Now, if they could verify and the time that they took to verification will lead us to certain kind of uh, fact that people create mental images. So, uh, to start with the idea and this is exactly what one of the um, Lee and Cooper actually uh, went ahead and did this experiment to prove that uh, people do form mental images and rotate. But even before going that what we could see here is this kind of uh, rotation that we are seeing here people do these kind of rotations or if you uh, look into uh, the other one. So, this is called a tesseract, a tesseract is basically an uh, four dimensional image and a four dimensional image rotation. So, people can also go ahead and rotate images in multiple dimensions and so this is an existence or this is an evidence for the existence of mental imagery or you would have uh, seen images like this. So, these are called uh, in very basic games uh, these kind of images are used and so these images uh, 
uh, it's, it's called Tetris. Uh, there is a game out there which is called Tetris, and so this kind of rotations uh, can be done. People are able to rotate. So these are the standards, and people are able to rotate these standards into these kind of uh, mm, uh, rotational uh, sequences. They can mentally rotate that. So uh, these are questions which have, you would have found uh, in some of your uh, exams, uh, some of your uh, competitive exams, where you get the sequence, uh, one standard sequence, and then a couple of sequences are given to you, where it is asked whether this sequence, uh, what is the next sequence from this sequence. And so, if you look into it, what is the next sequence that you uh, should get for this sequence? Obviously, the answer is A here, because this is the one sequence which can happen. So, if you rotate it by, uh, say, uh, almost 70 degree towards clockwise this way on this axis if you rotate it by 70 degree you will get this sequence. And so, this basically the existence of the fact that you can come up with an answer A uh, by rotating this was to through an axis by 70 degree is the fact that people are able to do mental rotation. Similarly, for this kind of image you can do rotations like this. Now, this kind of tests were done by uh, Shepard and Mesler and what they found out in their experiment, they showed that participants, uh, uh, they uh, uh, can rotate line drawings of three dimensional objects. So, in their, uh, in their experiment, they uh, took participants and they gave them simple line drawings like this. So, these kind of uh, line drawings are given to people and they were asked in, these subjects were asked in to basically verify whether which one of these line drawings can actually be the next occurrence or the next sequence from this one. So, this is what um, uh, your Shepard and Melzer actually experiment was all about. And if we are able to prove that people can exactly go ahead and uh, find an answer, which basically means that people are rotating, uh, mentally rotating images and that lead to the fact that people are able to create mental imagery or the evidence of mental imagery is established. So, they gave people this kind of line drawings and they asked people to rotate these in three dimensional axes. Now, in each trial, the subjects would see two type of drawings. So, two type of drawings were shown to people. In the first, the same object with one rotated to some degree. So, you either have, uh, so the first one as you see here is basically the same object which is rotated to some degree of rotation. So, as I said, if you rotate it 70 degree, you will find this is a 70 degree and so same image is there and it is being rotated. And here in this case, what has happened is the original image is being rotated as mirror image. So, the mirror image of uh, this is being so here the original is being rotated and here the mirror image of this diagram is being rotated to certain degree uh, certain degree. So, what Shepard and Melzer did was they took this kind of simple three uh, dimensional line drawings and gave people to verify certain sequences uh, by mentally rotating this image. And so, one of these was the same object with um, so one of these experiments had uh, rotations of the same object. Uh, which had been rotated to some degrees and in the other case the mirror image, uh, in the other case uh, mirror image uh, or reversal with or without rotation was used. So, the same image, the image was taken, a mirror image of this image was, uh, the original image was taken and that was rotated to certain degrees. So, either a mirror image was there or the mirror image rotated to certain degree was there and people were, need, uh, were asked to verify whether which of these sequences fit to the original sequence uh, through rotation. Now, the result of the experiment, what it showed is that the amount of time that participants actually took um, in deciding whether the same object has been rotated or a mirrored image reversal was there was directly proportional to the angle of rotation between the drawings. So, more the angle of rotation or higher the angle of rotation, the higher the time uh, people required, because uh, the more the angle of rotation, the more kind of rotational dynamics you have to use in your, uh, in your uh, uh, mentally and then more time you will require. If simple angles of rotations of 90, 180 or 360 are used, uh, then it is easier for you to rotate it, but if a uh, uh, angle of, uh, of uh, let us say 60 degree or 75 degree is used, now that type of rotation takes a long time, because uh, these 45, 90, 180, 270 or 360 are uh, huge angles that we see around us and so it is kind of popular, uh, perpendicular angles or popular angles and so it is easier for us. And so, what people from one what 
uh, measure found from their experiment, Shepard measure found from their experiment is that people were able to verify, but then the time period for verification depended on uh, how much the angle of rotation is. Also, there is a close relation between the angle of rotation of the drawings and the participants reaction time uh, strongly suggesting that people form mental rotation. So, that is what we were doing uh, or that is what I was actually trying to tell you that people were actually mentally rotating and so this evidence uh, or this experiment basically provides evidence to the fact that people use mental imagery that people go ahead and um, uh, form mental image and not only form mental images they also go ahead and rotate these mental images and so that is what uh, fact is or uh, the evidence for mental imagery is. And so this kind of images were also used so these are the uh, ones which are used uh, by Shepard and Mel and uh, this is mental rotation task based on canonical rotation. So, basically images in mirror image kind of a thing. So, these are three dimensional line drawings and these are two dimensional line. So, another question which puzzled researchers was. Uh, so, basically uh, uh, what we found out up till now is that Stepper and Menzler they established the fact that people were able to rotate an image mentally form an image first of all and then rotate them mentally to certain degrees and that was evident from the fact that how much reaction time uh, people were taking and that was directly proportional to the angle of rotation. Uh, the first fact being that people were able to verify certain rotations which are available or certain rotational uh, instances which are available and the fact that uh, uh, angles of rotations which, which were um, uh, at, uh, at a non so normal or not so popular angle uh, they were uh, taking more reaction times which basically means that people now were not only forming a mental image, but they were also rotated. Now, another question that was worrying people or that was worrying uh, psychologists were the fact that whether people mentally rotated the whole part of the image uh, or part of the image. So, once doing the mental rotation task or once taking an image and mentally rotating it, what was the kind of rotation that people were doing? Were they taking in part of the image and rotating it or were they actually rotating the whole image? And so, Lynn and Cooper in 75, they used or uh, designed an experiment to test this hypothesis. So, what they did was they took in some kind of an irregular polygon task and found that reaction time increased linearly with the angle of rotation and the rate of rotation uh, being same for all the polygons regarding of the complexity. So, basically the, uh, the idea that they found out the results that they found out first let us see the task that they have. So, this is the uh, kind of task that they have. These are the irregular uh, polygons. So, you have a 6 point, 8 point, 12 point, 16 point, 24 point uh, polygon. This is the standard form of the polygon and then you have the reflected forms of the polygon. Uh, these are the mirror images. So, reflected forms is basically mirror image. So, different mirror images were there and so these mental images or these uh, uh, polygons were taken in. So, this was the standard first uh, 6 point 8 point polygon and certain instances were given to people to test whether this fits into the scheme, whether uh, target uh, rotational image that was presented to them could be possible in the rotation uh, in the kind of rotation that they are doing to the mental images. So, three were used a standard form was used a reflected form was used and uh, rotated test stimuli were given to them. So, for example, this is rotated by 60 degree and people were asked to verify this whether this is possible with this kind of a polygon with a rotation. The question that stand uh, that uh, was being asked or that was being investigated was the fact that do people uh, rotate the whole image or partial image. And so, the results that Lynn and Cop uh, Cooper got uh, from these experiments was they found that the reaction time they increase linearly with the angle of rotation and the rate of rotation. Uh, so, basically the kind the, the speed at which the rotation people were performing and the angle the uh, kind of angle that they were rotating good, uh, it to. So, 45 90 degree were easier, but if uh, an angle of 75 80 or 95 degrees are used then people were taking more reaction time. Also, with this the speed of rotation dependent on this thing and also uh, the reaction time was. Uh, and in this case uh, the rate of rotation for all the polygons regardless of their complexity. So, the fact is no matter whether it is an 8 point polygon or a 12 point polygon or a 6 point polygon people were facing difficulty all along in terms of that if the angles of rotations were 
at uh, abnormal angles then people were taking more time. Now, in another study, so basically this proves the fact that people rotated the whole polygon instead of rotating parts of it people were actually rotating the whole polygon. So, this uh, study uh, demonstrates the fact that even if it was a 6 point, 8 point, 10 point or 12 point polygon people were actually going ahead and rotating it uh, and the only answer that they are getting is that the angle of rotation is the, uh, the only uh, question or the factor which decides the reaction time. Now, all the polygons were rotated at the same speed it was uh, either clockwise or anti clockwise and so uh, the fact here was that as uh, the angle of rotations of the original polygon onto uh, the, the target one. So, this is the one which is the rotated. So, this is my target polygon and this is my Q polygon and so, once the angle if the angles of rotations are 360 to 40 it is easier, but if the angles of rotation are 60 degree or 120 degree then the difficulty arises because these are abnormal angles people do not see these angles too much and so that was the result from these studies. Now, another study Cooper did in 76 uh, showed that mental rotations like physical rotations are continuous in nature. And so, what they did in this study, so uh, they wanted to study, Cooper wanted to study whether uh, these mental rotations were continuous in nature uh, in the sense that do people rotate in a continuous form. So, if I ask people, if I ask someone to rotate take a mental image of something and rotate in clockwise direction, do people rotate in, in continuous nature. And to test this they designed an experiment in which they presented people with um, with instances from the rotation. So, let us say uh, if I have an image uh, like this and I ask people to rotate this clockwise starting from this is 0 degree and uh, when people are rotating it I will stop them somewhere here uh, at, at some point of time. Let us say 2 minutes into uh, the rotation I will stop them and then I will show them a, a figure like this which is uh, let us say 60 degree rotated to the origin. So, this is the original angle. So, 60 degree rotated to the original angle. So, this is my original figure then uh, uh, this is at a 0 degree then I rotate it by 60 degree let us say this is 60 degree to the original angle. So, this angle is 60 degree and here is my rotated image. So, my rotated image will be something like this and so pe people were given this kind of images in between to verify whether this is there or not and this is was the experiments and so they found out that people were actually able to verify that which basically means that people were continuously rotating this polygon they were not rotating it at certain angles they were continuously rotating it and the method that they used to test this was they stopped people at certain points of rotation and presented them with a uh, instance of rotated image and ask them to verify whether this can exist or not or this is a part of their rotation or not. And so, this is a very simple task and so people were able to verify and which basically means that they were over people were rotating it continuously any image they were rotating it continuously. Also cognitive psychologists they started searching how people recognize objects presented in unusual angles. So, basically something is presented into an unusual angle let us say at a 95 degree. So, how do you recognize that an object? So, one possibility that was available to psychologists was to uh, that mentally rotate the image till it reaches the orientation of uh, uh, depiction or that uh, distinctive geons of the object remain visible we can recognize them with rotation. So, basically uh, if something is presented at an uh, abnormal angle uh, how do people recognize it. So, one proposal was that people actually either rotated it to uh, continuously to the uh, for to the point at which uh, the rotated image is exact match with uh, the original image of uh, uh, original image which is represented to you as target or what people were doing is they took the object took away the geons and rotated the geons to look into it. For example, one demonstration could be if I put a coin onto this table and uh, let us say any coin onto this table and then I do not look at it from a top view I come parallel to this table. So, this is my table and so I put a coin here and so do not look at the coin this way I looked at I look at the coin from this way. Now, when I look at the coin from this way or from uh, down up kind of a thing from this this uh, line of sight then what would happen. So, in this cases this will be an original angle this will be an abnormal angle. So, uh, for let us say if an uh, door is like this it is demonstrated in like this this 
and then when this door comes very nearby I do demonstrate it this way. So, basically when it is coming near to me it becomes larger in this way and so these are abnormal angles which are there. So, how do I verify that? So, what people did in terms of whether this is the same door. So, this is position 1 and this is position 2. So, in my position 1 my door is here and it is further away from me this is the hinge and in position 2 it is very near to me. So, this is the hinge and so it has uh, this is how the door looks like. So, how do I verify it uh, uh, this door at, uh, at a irregular angle? What I really do is I either there are two ways to it I either I rotate this door into a clockwise direction till it matches this particular figure this is one view or that distinct in geons of the object remain visible and we can recognize them with rotation. So, the idea here the geon here is a rectangle. So, a rectangle is the geon which forms this door. So, what I do is this rectangle is still visible to us whether it is lopsided or not whether this rectangle is bigger or smaller is not the question. The question here is whether this rectangle is visible to us and so if this rectangle is visible to us we can then rotate this geon and actually think that the door is uh, being shut or it is being moved towards me or away from me. And that is how uh, this uh, Steven Pinker and Tarr in 1989 they gave an explanation to the fact that how do people actually recognize object at unusual angles. And so, this is the uh, image that uh, uh, was used uh, by Lane and Cooper and so, this is the original image, this is the mirror image and this is the image which is uh, tested across various angles. So, 60, uh, 60 to 40 and 120 are angles which are abnormal angles, 180 and 360 degree are. Uh, so, 180 would be uh, basically a mirror image and 360 degree will be a complete rotational uh, of image of it and so, this is how people actually use it. And so, looking at this demonstration, so basically what we are looking at is this figure being rotated in a different plane and at different angles. So, this is basically how people go ahead and rotate it and so this is how mental rotation of images exist. And so, this mental rotation of images the fact that we can verify certain uh, rotations uh, uh, provide enough evidence for the fact that people do form mental images and mental imagery is actually a code which can be used. So, let us then look at some other aspects of this mental imagery. So, the question is what is the nature of the mental imagery that we are talking about, what is the form of it. So, one of the things is that visual Im uh, images they share properties with pictures, the visual images that we have they are more or less exactly like a picture. But what are images, what kind of properties do images have and how these uh, like and unlike the properties of real picture have that has to be discussed. So, what is the uh, one to one relation between a picture and an image that is what needs to be seen and what properties they share with this picture and what properties they do not, how are they like a picture, how they are not like and what is the distinction is what we are going to see in terms of the nature of imagery. So, Ronald Fink in 89, 1989 he proposed some fundamental principles of visual imagery. He said that visual imagery has certain fundamental properties, certain fundamental features which we can discuss and which we can see and these features basically correspond to the picture thing. So, what we did was he proposed five different fundamental principles and they took visual imagery, he took visual imagery in pictures and compared them across. So, what are these five uh, features of a mental image? Uh, first thing is something called implicit coding. So, what it says is that mental imagery uh, basically encodes some information implicitly which pictures cannot. For example, remember the first class that I asked you uh, in this section, in this session uh, the, the earlier session on visual imagery I asked you to think about what was on the wall on your uh, bedroom. And so, there was implicit information there were things which were in your mind or there were things in, in the image which you never thought about. So, you might have never thought uh, how many sills of the window are present, but then when I ask you this question you can mentally count it which means that the information about the number of sills uh, which your windows have uh, is implicitly encoded and that is what this basically uh, this principle says. So, it says that mental imagery is instrument in retrieving information about physical properties of objects or about physical relationships among objects that is not uh, explicitly encoded at a previous time and that is what uh, I was talking about the certain information which pictures cannot have visual images can have. So, you can have information certain information about uh, certain facts embedded into a visual imagery or visual image which is not possible at a picture level. 
The second thing is that perceptual equivalence. How a visual image is equivalent to a picture? It has perceptual equivalence. For example, it has been found that uh, imagery is functionally equivalent to perception of uh, the extent that similar mechanisms of the visual systems are activated when uh, objects are events are imagined as when the same objects or events are actually perceived. So, there were certain uh, there were studies which were done, certain new studies which were done uh, with an fMRI and it was found out uh, that the same areas of the brain get activated except the visual eye system which takes in new information when you imagine something. So, if people are asked to imagine a coffee cup and people are uh, shown a coffee cup, the way they perceive these two th things together, the number of areas, the kind of connections that these areas have are exactly the same. The same brain regions get activated, the same kind of connections are activated and so, uh, what happens is that imagery is more or less same as uh, looking at a picture or looking at something which is out there. So, it is imagery is basically same as looking the only difference being that there is no input, the input system is not there. The same visual cortex, the same uh, areas of the brain which verify an image, which does object recognition, which uh, lets the frontal cortex know what it is and then come out come up with a decision of what possible objects could the visual imagery be all those areas are the same and they get activated the same uh, way, but the only the input system which is the eye is not activated and so in this way visual images are similar to an picture. Now, the third principle which uh, Fing gave in terms of uh, a third property of a visual image is called spatial equivalence. Now, what does it mean? It means that the spatial arrangement of the elements of a mental image corresponds to the uh, way objects or their parts are arranged in actual physical surface or a actual physical space. So, basically uh, in uh, there are some experiments done by Coslin and so what they did was Coslin did was he created a fictitious map and in this map what he did was he made certain positions right. So, he created a map like this and in this map he cert created certain positions and uh, these positions had certain kind of placeholders. So, you have certain things on this maps and ask people to move from point A from point A to point B and place some hurdles here and so he looked at the time that people took to move from point A to point B. So, uh, what he did was he showed them map these positions and asked them to move. Later on they asked people to imagine this map to think about this map, think about a map of America, think about a map of India, start from uh, Kanyakumari and then uh, move towards Bangalore or start from Kanyakumari and move towards Bombay. Now, do that and what you have to do is you have to uh, then uh, basically in this movement describe all the places that you uh, uh, venture into or go into and then I show you actually the map of India and then ask you to move from point A to B kind of a thing a very simple explanation. Now, what they found out is that the time that people took right from moving from point A to B, the kind of arrangement, the kind of movement that people did in terms of the actual map is the same time and the same kind of uh, arrangement or same kind of movement that people did in mental imagery, which basically means that people when they move in terms of images, in terms of real pictures, in terms of real movement uh, and in terms of mental imagery, it is more or less same. So, the spatial locations in terms of moving in spaces, whether in, in whether through a mental imagery or through a picture or, or real uh, uh, motion or a real movement in terms of space are are more or less same. So, people took the same time from moving from point A to B in terms of uh, mental imagery when they imagined this map and th thought of the movement, then uh, uh, is similar to what people did in terms of making movements when they were actually moving from point A to B. Or the, uh, another experiment was done where they uh, where uh, Coslin showed people a flower uh, rather a tree and ask them to move from the top of the tree and start naming right. So, start naming what is at the top of the tree towards the bottom to the root start naming all the uh, uh, things that you find. And so, the time that people took and the number of uh, 
uh, the elements that they kept on saying when they move from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree or top of a flower to the bottom of a flower then the, um, uh, the number of elements that they said that the flower possessed uh, when moving from the top of a flower towards its stem or top of a tree towards its root was similar in terms of both in, in terms of actual spatial movement in actual movement of a flower as compared to the movement in terms of an imagery when they were asked to imagine this flower and made to move which basically means that in a spatial location in terms of spatial locations both the image and flowers are uh, sorry the image and uh, the pictures are same. The fourth uh, property is in terms of transformational equivalence and what does it say that imagine transformations and physical transformations exhibit correspondingly dynamic characteristics and are governed by the same laws and it is the same experiment which Cooper did in 1976. So, what happened in this experiment were people were actually given a cube to look at and they were asked to rotate this cube uh, through certain angles. Then they were asked to uh, basically uh, take this cube uh, mentally imagine this cube and make the rotations and then people were tested with certain instances. What was found out that the same amount of time or the same amount of verification was uh, done by both uh, or the same accuracy of verification was uh, outputted when people were transforming mental images as where they were physically transforming an object which basically means that people while uh, uh, imagining we are also able to transform or also able to mentally rotate images and that is what we saw in the earlier examples also. So, visual images are not just static people also transform them and these transformations these rotations are either on the axis or across axis or a different axis are similar to the physical transformations which is there. And so, the result from Cooper remember the result uh, the experiment of Cooper 76 where they made people transform certain images onto certain angles and then tested uh, certain instances with the accuracy of it the same experiment can be used as an evidence here. And the fifth property of uh, think of visual images is called structural equivalence. Now, what does it mean? The structure of mental images corresponds to the actual perceived images. And so, in this case uh, Coslin and Farah and Frigel they gave people certain structure certain images uh, which had very uh, uh, bleak structure and certain image which has complex structure. For example, they showed people uh, let us say uh, the drawing of a fish uh, I am not very good at drawing but drawing of a fish like this and so it has very less detail or they showed people the drawing of a fish like this which has scales like this right and uh, this kind of fins and other things here. So, this is a complex image because it has more details into it and these are a simple image which has lesser details into it. So, when given people these two kinds of things and ask uh, and, and then ask them to retrieve more time was taken by people to verify to actually uh, make the structural verification or to actually uh, perceive this one the complex picture as uh, compared to the simple picture. Now, in terms of imagination also when people were asked to imagine a fish like this with these many features they took longer time to imagine a fish like this or they took uh, more time uh, for complex image imaginations than imaginations of simple images which basically means that in terms of structure also in terms of uh, the fact that when people imagine they imagine with complexity where they imagine uh, complexity with more time the more complex a picture is take, takes more time because more number of elaborations have to be done. And so, this idea of more number of elaborations are also in present in visual imagery which means that the same kind of verifications in terms of complex and simple images happen both for the, uh, the picture for the physical transformations as well as mental transformations. So, five different kind of uh, things to look at uh, again reviewing quickly back into what uh, it is all about. And so, uh, the five thing first visual images have implicit coding. So, it has implicit informations into it which pictures do not then perceptual equivalence. Uh, 
perceptually speaking the same areas of the brain are active when a picture is imagined or a, pic and a picture is seen. The third is structural the spatial equivalence. So, in terms of movement in space they are more or less the same. The fourth is transformational equivalence. So, mental images can be transformed similar to what physical, uh, physical pictures could be and then the fifth is structural equivalence in terms of structure in terms of complexity the same kind of complexity the same kind of processes exist with uh, both the uh, mental image as well as the actual image. Now, there are certain critiques to this mental imagery, uh, certain uh, criticisms which have been there to this mental imagery and what are these criticisms? So, there are three main criticisms. First is tacit knowledge and demand characteristics. So, basically mental imagery has been criticized on certain uh, factors. First is the tacit knowledge, people have some kind of knowledge or people gather some kind of knowledge uh, from experimenters in terms of transformation. So, that is one thing and demand characteristics is certain task mental imagery task demand certain characteristics or demand certain uh, kind of uh a response from people. So, that is one thing and so the, that is how uh, it is looked at. The second is the picture metaphor where a comparison between picture and mental image is done and the third is the propositional theory. So, let us look at these critics one by one. The first is uh, tacit knowledge and demand characteristics and so what uh, Silent in 81 they argued that the results from many imagery studies they reflect participants underlying uh, an implicit tacit knowledge and uh, and beliefs about the task rather than their construction and manipulation of visual images. So, what they found out or what they told is that people were actually uh, what they were doing is they were look uh, they were acting up onto something called experimenter effect. It basically means that experimenter who were asking us them to do these uh, construct this mental images they were actually providing some kind of a clue. So, either mentally or either physically mentally or some form and so this was the reason why people were able to uh, create mental images or, or do all kind of manipulation into mental images. So, Fink with his example of moving the coffee cup provided evidence to uh, so silence cup. So, basically what was this coffee cup experiment it is a very simple experiment and so what it was that if a uh, uh, Coslin actually uh, initiated this experiment or uh, and Fink elaborated onto it. So, what the experiment was that a coffee cup was put onto a table and it was asked to be moved from point A to point B. So, I have a coffee cup like this uh, onto this is a table and this is position A and this is position P and I want to move my coffee cup from point A to point B. Now, physically two ways are possible I will pick up this coffee cup from here and then move it over air to point B or I can slide the cup from point A to point B. Now, when I do that a certain amount of time requires. Now, when I have people were asked to imagine to move this coffee cup from A to B what Fink found out that they could do it very quickly they actually could do it very quickly, but then people were pausing people were taking thinking about taking the coffee cup and taking the same amount of time or rather a little bit more time when moving the coffee cup from point A to B. And why was this there? They were the reason that thing gave is that the experimenter were giving certain uh, demand characteristics or certain kind of clues which asked or which made people mentally pause the coffee cup position in their head and then take that amount of time. What they were thinking is or what their conclusion is that people actually thought that uh, uh, although this can be done quickly, but this is the amount of time it should take and so I should pause the cup mentally. And so, these type of talks uh, 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 the tasks are called cognitively Im, uh, Im, uh, imperentable, which basically means that uh, these tasks are open to uh, uh, influences from belief systems from the uh, uh, from uh, your previous knowledge and so on and so forth. So, what people did was people although took uh, experimentally same time in terms of movement from point A to B on a table and in terms of imagination studies also, but it was not that people were had uh, uh, this this is because of imagination. What really happened is that certain knowledge from uh, previous ex, uh, uh, situations or certain clues from the experimenter made people actually mentally pause the cup somewhere and then take exactly the same time that the uh, that a physical movement would do and that is what their explanation is. Now, file in 81 this states the uh, states that tasks are uh, that are affected by people's belief and expectations are termed as cognitive uh, penetrable and so that is what it is. So, basically what happens is since these kind of tasks 
give the person doing it a chance to use the knowledge that this is the time it should took from uh, it should take from moving the coffee cup from A to B. And so, what they do is they actually go ahead and mentally pause it. So, it is basically not uh, the image uh, construction or the image movement which is taking up the time. It is basically a mentally pausing the idea that people get this clue and using this clue as mentally pausing it. Now, such task makes it obvious to participants that they ought to perform and are said to have demand characteristics. So, such task basically in the coffee cup moving experiment people know that it should take at least 1 second, 2 second, 5 second and so on and so forth. And so, what they do is although mentally they can move very quickly they pause somewhere or they take more time because to match the uh, idea that uh, this, this cup should this movement should be matched to the actual time. Also, sometimes experimenter unconsciously give subtle cues to the participants. Now, in uh, Intens and uh, uh, Intons and Peterson call such effect a experimental expectancy effect. So, what happens is sometimes in these experiments, what the experiment tend to do is the experimenter tends to give certain clues to uh, to uh, the subjects who are doing mental rotation. For example, a, a probable nod uh, if they are verifying a particular uh, angle uh, or a cue with which has been rotated at a certain angle. So, maybe a subtle cue or a certain aha or a certain gesture which gives the subject or which provides the subject some kind of a uh, clue of whether it is right or not. And so, they say that these clues are the reason why they are uh, doing it so correctly and so mental imagery is uh, suffering from these kind of problems. The other critique is called the picture metaphor. So, what is here? So, visual images are casually spoken as mental pictures. So, visual images are th uh, thought of as a mental picture. So, how they are uh, how far the statement is true for file in 73, he pointed out that pictures and images differ in several ways. There are men although mental imagery is thought of as a mental picture, but there is vast demarcation between what a picture is and what a mental image is. And so, what is this demarcation first? pictures can physically be looked at without knowing what uh, uh, it is in a picture that we are looking, but mental images cannot be done. So, if you are looking at a picture of someone you do not know right and so in this case is so you have a friend and a friend has a friend and so you are looking your friends and other uh, the friends friends picture you might not know the friends friend and so you can very well look into it without knowing anything about it or a, a picture of some place that you have visited if you are looking into it you might not know where this place is and you it is perfectly okay to look into it. But visual imagery cannot go through those parameters you have to first know. So, if I am thinking about the United States I am actually know that this is the United States. I am thinking about Berlin where I have lived for some time. So, the idea is that I am thinking about Berlin which means that I have named it and so I am thinking about that place. So, I have to know Berlin before thinking about it or forming a mental image about it. Whereas, in pictures it is not necessary. So, first difference. Second difference pictures and images are disrupted and disruptible in different ways. So, pictures can be destructed or it can be disrupted and uh, 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 destructed in uh, different ways. For example, uh, if certain uh, you can cut out certain things from a picture certain. So, if you do not like your best friend who has now become your enemy you can cut him out of the picture, but if you try cutting out something from a mental image the mental image, image disappears. So, basically you cannot cut certain features from a mental image. Third images are more easily distorted by viewers interpretation. So, if I give you an interpretation if I say that in, in a if I show you a picture of a friend two friends together which are both a common friend and then I say that this friend is a little bit shrewd. Now, there would not be a change in this picture, but as if I ask you to imagine a friend or imagine your friend's friend and your friend and then say he is shrewd the kind of image changes the mental image will change. Uh, particularly a more cunning kind of an image of the second friend would uh, appear, but in terms of picture this cannot happen. So, basically these distortions can happen in terms of images, but in terms of pictures it cannot. And so, the comparison between a picture and mental image is not true because of these factors which have been outlined. Now, also the fact that uh, to prove that people's uh, view or people's interpretation defines a picture a kind of this kind of setup was given. Now, people were given this kind of a bizarre drawing to look at and then in two different sessions, two different settings or two different uh, retrieval sessions. In one session people were shown this and they were uh, then given a clue that this is letter C and when a retrieval was done after two weeks. So, this is retrieval 1 after 2 weeks, this is retrieval 1 after 2 weeks, 
but then the same group is there so this is after two weeks then later on they come back after one month they have shown this again and then given this kind of a verbal label and after this verbal label after two weeks an interpretation or a retrieval was done. So, when they were sh uh, shown this and said that it is letter C this is the retrieval, but it was when they were uh, said that it is a crescent moon this is the retrieval and so basically this is what it is. So, images mental images are dependent on people's interpretation. So, when a verbal label when this was shown and a verbal label hat was given this is the retrieval image, but when it was shown and a beehive was what was uh, uh, told what was asked them or what was uh, told to them this is what it is this is the retrieval. Similarly, this a dumbbell would result in this an eyeglass would this and if a verbal label of 4 was given to it a 4 was there and a 7 was given to it a 7 interpreted onto it and similarly so on and so forth. So, basically this image this kind of image was given to people this kind of verbal label was given to people. So, these verbal labels were given to people and then later on a retrieval was done. So, depending on the kind of verbal label the interpretations or the retrieval imagery was different and so this basically proves that the imagery is open to interpretations of people. The third kind of problem the critique which has been uh, uh, said in terms of uh, uh, of mental imagery is called the propositional theory. So, what is propositional theory? So, propos originally it was believed that there are two codes that uh, of mental imagery one was the vocal code or the verbal code which is from the short term memory and then there is a semantic code which is basically uh, the uh, long term memory interpretations and long term memory storing. So, original mental imagery, uh, imagery idea is that mental images are a special type of encoding and so later on when mental imagery studies it was believed that mental imagery is also a code for long term memory. Now, propositional theorists they say that it is not true. So, what propositional theory says is there are no codes, so there are no ways of, uh, on which a code is safe and that is what they say. They say that there is only one kind of encoding into long term memory and that is neither visual nor verbal in nature and they suggest that the uh, suggested that the experience of having a mental image is just really a epiphenomena and so what is stored into uh, the long term memory is basically a, uh, a proposition and what is a proposition proposition are basically relationships between items for example if i uh, write on book and table this is how remember from the first class that we did a special equivalent. So, this is a propositional code which says that the book is on the table. So, on what is on the first object the book is on where it is on it is on the table. So, this is how codes are because this is a proposition because it makes relationship this on is a proposition which is making relationship between the book and the table and so this is how it actually goes ahead and is, is saved. So, basically then this is the code that is saved into the uh, LTM rather than a visual code and a verbal code. Also, uh, Philin suggested that uh, the experience of having a mental image is really just a, an a epiphenomena, something that happens with a process, but does not cause the process. Instead, it is just a byproduct. Uh, now, without the epiphenomena, the process would go uh, just like normal, not necessary for process to occur. So, what he says is mental imagery that we talk about is just an epiphenomena, it is nothing uh, special into it. And uh, he has given several examples, the seven clues for that. For example, he says that when a computer is calculating something, it often has a flashing light uh, which shows uh, that it is calculating. And most people believe that this flashing light represents what it is calculating. But actually, the flashing light has nothing to do with uh, it is an epiphenomena, it has nothing to do with what is going on. Similarly, mental imagery is epiphenomena like this because if the light blows away tomorrow or if the light is dysfunctional, which does not mean that the computer stops working. So, this light is just a, uh, uh, a byproduct of whatever is happening and so light has nothing no relevance to the computation. Similarly, mental imagery has no relation to the computation because codes that are used in mental image is basically propositional in nature. So, instead of encoding uh, instead the encoding is propositional in nature where concepts are stored as symbols and what is stored is not the physical relationship, but a conceptual one like the network model of memory. So, as I showed to you this is the proposition and so in the proposition I have a book network a concept and a table concept and then the relation to this is the on concept. I can uh, basically this is the proposition which is saved this is neither verbal nor uh, 
uh, visual in nature. So, what is stored in memory in long term memory are concepts and symbols and these concepts and symbols form some kind of a network and uh, this conceptual network and this is how the storing happens in long term memory. So, it would make sense that trying to scan a path from a flag to the back of the boat to the cabin would take less time than scanning from the flag to the emblem. Because when we are scanning from the back of the boat to the front of the boat, so from the back of the boat to the cabin has, uh, is, is, is longer. So, look at this image, I am, uh, if I am scanning from the back of the boat, this is where the emblem is and this is where the cabin is. So, if I am, if I am scanning from the rear deck to the front deck, it has three levels to go from and so it should, uh, there are three prepositions to be verified and so takes more time. Whereas, if I have to verify the emblem which is there from here, it has two levels only. So, it is easier and so that is what it says, uh, it, should, it would take less time than scanning from the flag to the emblem since you would have to move from uh, two uh, level of uh, networking or two levels of the hierarchy to four levels of the hierarchy. So, it is possible to explain scanning times without having to use mental images and that is why the higher scanning time or lower scanning time that people are using in terms of complex and non-complex images remember Fink's idea is because of the fact that not people are making images it is because the number of propositions that they are testing the number of hierarchies that they are moving in a network is more as compared to less. And so, if I have to verify uh, come to the emblem from here from the portal it will take more time because more number of networks or more number of propositions have to be tested than if I have moved from here to here where the number of propositions is less. And so, the last section has to deal with something called spatial cognition. So, basically how do we move in a spatial environment and so, the three ways of moving in a spatial environment when we move in spaces, when we move in enclosed spaces or any kind of space out there, there are three things to be looked at. First, there is something called the space of the body. Now, this is where are the parts of the body located at any particular time. So, while moving in a spatial location, while moving in your environment, we use three different kinds of information. First is the called the space of the body. So, we move according to something called uh, the egocentric approach or the space of the body approach. In this case, the movement is done in terms of where my hands and legs are. So, left from uh, uh, my left, my right towards the front of me, towards the back of me is kind of a thing. So, where my body parts are and based on that I make a movement in uh, spaces in uh, 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 spaces which are finished fixed with locations. And the second is the space around the body, the area immediately around you. And so, it could be in terms of uh, not in terms of the body, not in terms of certain regions of the body, but in terms of the area around the body. So, uh, in front of me, at the back of me uh, kind of a thing. So, in, in both of these are basically the egocentric right. So, towards my left hand, towards my right hand, but in front of me, in back of me is kind of space around the body. So, towards uh, towards the uh, left of my left hand, towards the right of my right hand is basically space around the body. So, two types of information both are egocentric in nature and that is what we use. We also use spaces of navigation, larger spaces that we walk through, travel or explore. So, in this case what we say is, well, this is called the allocentric allocentric movement. So, A L L O C E N T R I C allocentric and this is egocentric. So, egocentric is making yourself as the center, allocentric is making external objects. So, left from the hotel, right from the uh, cabin, uh, back from something, front from something. So, using something into the environment, so, using certain landmarks, movement using landmarks. In these cases, I am using the body as uh, object of movement. So, spaces in front and back of me or spaces in relation to certain body parts or I could use spatial navigation in terms of certain uh, features or certain objects which are there into the environment which are called landmarks. Now, our mental representations of these spaces may be distorted, made neater and more regular. So, basically based on these we create something called the spatial map or cognitive map and these cognitive map actually help us in moving and this is the mental image that we make. So, when we make a mental image of the space around us, we use three reference points. So, one is with the self, it is uh, with our self, then with uh, landmarks and combine them together to form mental images and these mental images are then used to move around any space out there into the environment, any space into the environment. So, basically what we did in this today's lecture is we tagged on to what we learned in the last lecture. So, what we did was we verified the fact that mental imagery is there by looking at rotational studies. 
Now, with in addition to that, we looked at that is uh, how rotational studies complement the idea that mental imagery exists and we looked at certain kind of answers in terms of angle of rotation being the only factor which, uh, which uh, guides the rotational mechanism or the rotational time that we take. In addition, we also looked at certain principles of mental imagery. So, five different principles in terms of things theory and then we looked at certain critiques or certain criticisms of the idea of mental imagery for example, demand characteristics the idea that the codes that uh, the brain uses are only propositional codes or the fact that pictures are not mental images. And lastly, we, we looked at how special cognition is stored. So, spaces around us are stored as mental images and I said there are three reference points in terms of your body, in terms of the external landmarks and in terms of spaces which is in front or back of your body. So, uh, thank you and we will meet again in the next lecture.